shape. As far as expression-wise, what are you leaning towards? I'm leaning towards... Happy to be there or want to bite someone's head off? No, happy to be there. Okay. More happy to be there. Okay. Okay, a little bit of smile. That looks really good. These little bit there, that would be a V. Coming down? Yeah, like a little V. Okay. The face will be what tells the story. Now, long after I'm gone, you want to make sure that you get the face right so that the story is more accurate. You gonna be a football player when you grow up? Today is the best day of your life. Believe Give it. me. Hate you some day like that. Greatest leader I've ever known. What a ride it's been. We're going home. He's going down to Detroit, baby. I'm going home. The last game I ever played, right in here. Hmm. A lot different quiet here. Wow, it's pretty cool. I'll never forget just taking it all in, watching everything, and that's when it all hit me. This is it. This is the Super Bowl. And I was in my hometown. It was special. It was a special moment. Jerome Bettis' football life ended where it began, in Detroit, Michigan. But in many ways, the bus never left home. Family was the foundation throughout his career. Before every game, I always know where my mom and dad are. Once I found them, you know, I give them that, a, a chest pump. That's just because they were so much a part of my football life. They came to every single game that I played. That's the whole fam up there. Whatever he did, we did. If it was three degrees below zero and he was playing, we were sitting there, froze solid watching him play. In Pittsburgh, Bettis found a second home and became the patriarch to a new generation of Steelers. We were just so close as a family and him being the big brother to the whole group. I followed everything you told me. You was a mentor to me from the word go. The blueprint you gave me was for real and I love you for that. You talk about the family, I think it starts with Mama Bettis. You're a mom to all of us, and teammates. You welcome us all to your home. You're welcome home. You're in our hometown. We're going to take care of you. We're going to feed the guys. That's just who they are. It's all about family, and it's all about kind of taking care of your people. Welcome to my house, sir. Welcome home. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. I take things that I've learned as a leader from him and tried to do the same thing that he did with me and with young guys, with our young guys that I've had. He represented everything I believed in in the game of football. There's no question he's held as a standard that a lot of our players look to when they want to try to understand what it is to, to be a Steeler. He is the personification of Steeler football. Today's Steeler, they look up to him in the way that he looked up to Joe Green. When you think of the Pittsburgh Steelers, you think of run game. And when you think of run game, obviously your own bed pops in your head. If you need me. You know you're on the phone call away. Yep. Right. He brought back the tradition of the Pittsburgh Steelers and continued that bruising style of play. <laughs> He's one of the greatest. Hurt, limping, whatever it was, he was going to give you everything he had. When I think of Hall of Famous, it's people like him who gave it their all. Please understand that this night, it's not about me. It's about all those who have impacted my life. The extended Bettis family now includes those enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And every kid from Detroit who one day hopes to get there. You guys need to understand that these decisions in life 
can change your life, can impact your life, and can derail you from all your dreams. No one knows that better than Jerome Bettis, the player who ended his career a hometown hero, almost never made it out of Detroit. I want to take you on a bus ride that started at 10384 Aurora in Detroit, Michigan, and has ended up at George Hallis Drive, home of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. He's a good individual. He's a great athlete. I wish everybody could be like Jerome Bettis. I sat in the same seat that you guys are sitting in right now. My philosophy was, I came from the streets of Detroit. I'm not going back. So I'm going to do whatever it takes for me to be successful. I didn't start playing football until my freshman year of high school. I was sitting one day at my desk doing some paperwork, and I heard a knock on the door. Coach, my name is Jerome Bettis, and I want to play football for you. I saw this kid look like a, a black Superman. Dozier says he lift his head up and he saw this big strapping boy. And my reply to his question was, hell yes, son, you can play for me. As soon as Jerome Bettis stepped on a football field, he felt at home. I was the number one fullback in the country and I was a number two linebacker. I was a better linebacker in high school than I was a running back. Please take time to view this highlight film that I've put together for you and evaluate my players. Six feet, 235 pound fullback linebacker, runs a 4.540. He is a 3.5 grade point average student. Bettis was beginning a path that would lead to football immortality but he almost strayed in a much different direction. I got a report, said, Coach, Jerome is trying to sell drugs. I said, what do you mean? It's not Jerome. Drugs were all over. It was very prevalent in my neighborhood. Some of my friends, we had an opportunity to now sell drugs. The guys he was hanging around with were killers. I told him, you want money? You're going to be an instant millionaire if you go to pros. So I called his mother up and explained what was happening. He said, you have a million dollar baby. He's about to make a mistake and ruin his career. My husband and I, we instilled that in those kids, right and wrong, and that's something that you don't do. I talked to, I was blue in the face, and my God, it worked. It worked. He stopped. And he, I guess he knew it was wrong. I, I don't know. I don't know. But it worked. It kind of struck a nerve to the point where I said, okay, well, I am going to, to stop. I'm going to give it all up. And I'm going to pursue football as a dream. When my father sent me off to college, he told me one thing. He said, son, sending you off to school, I don't have much to give you, but I have a good name, so don't mess it up. Well, Dad, I hope I made you proud. Let's talk about watching your son become a football star at Notre Dame. What was that like for you? <laughs> it was incredible. In his first year as the starting fullback at Notre Dame, Jerome Bettis had 20 touchdowns, a single season school record that still stands.
I was the announcer at Notre Dame when he was in college. When you saw this guy touch the ball, you just kept thinking, that's not possible. Something that big can't move that fast with those kind of moves. Jerome was unbelievable. They could not stop him. I knew he was first round draft pick. The uh, Los Angeles Rams select Jerome Bettis, running back Notre Dame. I went to the right team for me. Chuck Knox was the head coach. He had a reputation for running. They called him Ground Chuck because he loved to run the football. He envisioned me as a tailback, not as a fullback. And I think that decision changed my life. The 10th overall pick ran for over 1,400 yards in 1993, second most in the NFL, and was named the Offensive Rookie of the Year. Pitch back to Bettis, turns it right. Bettis cuts up to the 30, Bettis to the 35, on his feet at the 40, 45, 50. Touchdown for Jerome Bettis, 71 yards. You scored 197 touchdowns last year and rushed for, <laughs> what was it, 7,846 yards. I uh, wish. Taps on no the all-time list. No Hall way. Hall of Fame, brother. No Hall way. of Fame. Not yet. Not no, yet. Hall of Fame. That's a long way. I got a long way to go. I get there, though. Don't Hall rush me. The first year, it was like a whirlwind for him. He's throwing himself into the L.A. party scene. I hadn't really been into, you know, parties and clubs and all this. And so now, all of a sudden, you know, I'm the talk of town. I'm the big guy on campus, so to speak. We went to Prince's Club, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar came up to him. And I'm just like, like, wow. Arsenio Hall, Eddie Murphy, Maggie Johnson. I'm saying to myself, you've got to be kidding me. He was big time in California, and I'm thinking, he doesn't need to be out there. I said, he's going to get caught up in these drugs and all this drinking and the women. Of course, he loved women, and he's a good-looking guy, and the women loved him. So I'm thinking, this is not good. And I said, Jerome, you need to come home. Mom! <laughs> mm. Yeah. Huh. It was, like, discouraging. Here I am, the NFL's, you know, rookie of the year, and I'm back home in Detroit in my room taking out the garbage. And then he'd take out the trash. I told him, take out the trash. You know, just... just. <laughs> I told mom and dad, I said, we got to talk about this girls in my room thing <laughs> because they always said, at our house... No girls in the in the bedroom, and I'm saying, wait a second now. I, I bought this house now. We got to talk about that rule. So, we had some we had some issues we had to iron out. <laughs> the bus was beginning to get in gear, but the Rams still finished with double digit losses in each of Bettis's first two seasons. Coming from a school where we won 90% of the time, it was eye-opening, like, wait a minute, man, we are we suck. As the Rams moved to St. Louis in 1995, they fired Chuck Knox. New head coach, Rich Brooks, began his tenure without his star running back. Tried to convince him to come in, but uh, uh, his agent uh, and he, he decided they, they wanted a new contract. I felt as though I had outperformed my rookie contract two years, 2,000 yard seasons, two Pro Bowls, still in a rookie contract. Bettis never did get an extension. And in the 1995 season opener, he ran for only four yards. I called him on Monday and said, Jerome, I don't know why you didn't go to the game, but somebody did wore your jersey and your number. I know you'd never play like that, but I'd find out who's impersonate you, and I'd stop it, because I think he's hurting your reputation. I hung the phone up. Never gave him a chance to say it worked. I wasn't the same football player that left Notre Dame, because here was a player that was pretty selfish uh, because of how the game had changed me in that we weren't having the team success, so I was more interested now in the individual success. 
By the end of the year, the Rams' former workhorse was phased out of the offense, averaging six carries over the final six games. We didn't run it as much as they had run it under Chuck Knox. So maybe, you know, maybe it, it, it was a, a not, not a great fit. I don't know. Once again, it was time for a return to Detroit. Jerome came home. He was thinking about not going back, getting out of football. He said, I'm going back to school and I'm going to make sure I have my degree because I don't think football is going to be it for me. A lot of the losing was being lumped on my back as being my fault. I had made the decision in my head that I was not going to play for Rich Brooks, period. I did tell him that I thought he ought to lose a little weight and get in a little better shape. The spell, the bad rumors, your physical condition right now, tell me about it. Oh, I'm in great shape. I don't know where the rumors came from, but uh, I'm in great shape. Uh, Jerome Bettis, he got into Rich Brooks' doghouse, and he's not getting out. The only way he gets out of his doghouse is if he gets out of town. At the 1996 draft, St. Louis selected Lawrence Phillips in the first round and traded Bettis to Pittsburgh. We find out Rich Brooks was putting Jerome Bettis on the trade block. I said, wow, this is a great match. He just was a natural in our offense. No, 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 no. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, 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 baby. We also played the Rams that first year. This was personal to him. They said I was done, over with, finished. Yeah. Wait till they get a load of me. In that game, I got a chance to kind of right some of the wrongs that was said about me. And the Bucs walks into the end zone for that Steeler touchdown against his former teammates. And one thing that was said about me was that I wasn't a game changer. And so I broke a 50-yard run and kind of changed the game. Jerome Bettis says hello to his former head coach, Rick Brooks, with a 50-yard dash. Jerome had over 100 yards very early in the third quarter, two touchdowns, and I took him out. He was trying very, very hard to get back into the game. Man, don't close me for the day, are you? Oh, man. No, no. I don't need about 30, 40 more. Last time. Then he becoming a pain in the ass. I'm going to get back on the phone. Is your dad here today? Yeah. You tell him I need to talk to him after this game. Nope. <laughs> I'm talking to your mom and dad afterwards. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to tell, tell Mr. and Mrs. Bass I need to see him. It's like a parent-teacher parent conference. Huh? KB, great job. Great job. Thanks a lot. Good job. Good job. I know it's meant a lot to you, too. It did. It did. I'm glad it did. I'm glad we did the way we did it. Oh, man. It was special. It was special because I got a chance to, to get that vindication. I kind of look at it like I probably helped him get into the NFL Hall of Fame by doing that trade because if he'd have stayed in St. Louis, uh, I'm not sure those same numbers and those things would have happened. You know what? We're going to keep your ass here for a while, too. Yeah, I got to. You got to keep me. I want to retire, Coach. I want you to retire yeah. because you know what? This is your city. Oh, man, no doubt. And you know what? You're my guy. <laughs> Not bad. Yeah, good job, Mom. Nice, nice shot for the first one. Good job, Mom. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's go. Jerome is very competitive. There we go. Whether it's the golf course or it's bowling. Our very first date in Pittsburgh, we were holding hands in the car, and I felt his thumb on top of my thumb, and I thought, that's strange. So I moved my thumb again, and his thumb went back on top, and I thought, this is so odd. He thought I was having a thumb war with him, but more importantly, he was holding my thumb down. I'm like, this is our first date in this city and we're doing thumb war when I wasn't. So Jerome is competitive, period. It doesn't matter the setting. Woo! And he likes to brag when he wins. How easy is that? He does this crazy ninja dance that, you know, is his thing. And he starts kicking and hitting and, you know, makes his and then he chops us all up, you know, in the process, and it's like his victory dance. If I don't get on, I give you five bucks. A piece. Five bucks a piece. Ah! Oh, go! Go! 
Do you know the nickname that they had for your dad? The bus. I was gonna say that, but yeah, the bus. <laughs> Why do you think they called him that? Because he's so big and he runs over people like a bus. He would trample anybody in his way. When I came to Pittsburgh, I think Myron Cope said, he kind of looks like the bus. The bus. And then that was it. And there's a, an avenue for the bus. The bus shakes them off like flies. From the Buffalo 43, here comes the bus. And he's got that tennis steam. He's breaking tackles. He's still on his feet at the 30, the 25, the 20. The bus goes 43 Express. I mean, he got me fired up. When he would make runs, um, it got me excited. I probably, at times, was living through him. I called him a bully at times, you know, because he ran over, over, you know, so many of those little guys. DB, sometimes linebackers. And a bus sleeps Cleet Marchong over his spine. I'm thinking to myself, don't you know that someone else's child that you're treating like that? You know, like, who do you think you are? I'm just glad you're on my team. <laughs> hitting JB is like hitting a tree stump. When you hit him, he just so solid and low to the ground that it's, uh, and it's like, oof, okay. Every game, JB was coming. His size was one thing. But the way he played, you would think he was a scat back. He had the best feet for a big man that I've ever seen. He could jump cut in a hole. But at the same time, he's doing it at 240, 245 pounds. The quick feet is hereditary. Jerome told us he gets those quick feet from his mother who loves to dance. Jerome Bettis, Jerome Bettis, he is surely the real thing. He ain't no head of lettuce. I ain't fast, I'm kind of quick. <laughs> well, I ain't fast, I'm just, I'm just kind of quick. In his 10 seasons in Pittsburgh, the bus made very few stops. They didn't have great quarterbacks in those days. I mean, Cordell Stewart had his moments, but they had Mike Tomczak, they had Kent Graham, they had Tommy Mannix, so he was it. I mean, and everybody knew it. Jerome was getting the ball, and they still couldn't stop. He still get 1,400, 1,600 yards. Jerome Bettis ran for over 1,000 yards in six straight seasons. The six-time Pro Bowler would finish his career as the fifth leading rusher in NFL history. Yeah, he passes Jim Bryant. He still ranks sixth on the all-time list. Like his feet, his mouth never seemed to stop running. Woo! Woo -hoo -hoo! Woo! That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. It got me cranking up now. It cranking me up. Woo, it's gonna be a long day for somebody. So fast running around blocks. Come get some. They asked for me. They wanted me. Well, they got me. Bettis usually had no problem being heard. We'll have a toss to determine who receives. But on a Thanksgiving day in his hometown, he didn't come through loud and clear. Call it plays in the air. Heads is the call. He said heads, it is a tails. Oh, I guess he said tails. He did. Bettis has always hated to lose at anything, whether it's coin flips or thumb wars. Yet for most of his career, this ultimate competitor couldn't obtain the ultimate prize. Time to go to work. I've had a lot of individual success. But for me, the only thing that drives me now is a championship. I mean, that's the one thing that's eluded me all these years. And to complete that journey, that's the ultimate goal for me. Bettis had been close, only to come up painfully short. No Super Bowl for the wonderful Steelers. Enduring home losses in the 1997 and 2001 AFC Championship games. Look out, and New England picks it up, and there's a lateral. 
I'm not getting any younger. And I'm saying to myself, man, these opportunities don't come every day. So it really hurt. It was just so hard for us, you know, because I could feel his pain, you know, and everything, just despair with him. And that's when I realized Jerome's got to get to the Super Bowl. Yeah. I got chills right now, boy. Got me thinking Ray Lewis out here somewhere. Jerome Bettis has always known how to reach an audience, whether he is giving back to youth football camps in Detroit or promoting summer jobs programs throughout Pittsburgh. Now you get an opportunity to make some money, to put money away if you choose to, bank account, you know, check, you know, checking account, all those kind of things. Mentorship is nothing new to Bettis. He was the big brother that I never had. He's the guy that when I came into the league, kind of took me under his wing and was teaching me what it takes to be a leader. You can't be cliquish, you know. You can't just hang out with all the black players at a table. You know, during lunch, go sit with the white guys. Go sit with the special teams. Go sit with the, the place kicker, the holder, the, the, the free agents, you know, the practice squad guys. That's what Jerome taught me. Bettis even welcomed those who could have taken his job. Backs like Richard Huntley, Amos Zaraway, Deuce Staley, and Willie Parker. Yeah, I'm just an undrafted free agent, so when I met him, I just thought he was just going to look at me as like, uh, he's going to be gone, like he's just a jersey number. But he put value in me just from the start. He made me believe. He made me think I belong. And um, that's strong. Jerome Bettis was selfless. Jerome Bettis took less money. Jerome Bettis took less of a role late in his career. It was almost like the lesser role he accepted, the bigger the role he had in our team in terms of leadership. Well, I'll never forget the first day I was here. I was walking in, he was walking out, and you know, I saw him coming. I was like, holy cow, it's Jerome Bettis, you know? You get all excited as a, as a young guy. And he walks right up to me, he's like, Ben, welcome. He opens my notebooks, I got both hands full. He writes Jerome on it, and he writes his number, and he says, anything I can ever help you with, I'm here for you, don't hesitate to call. And to me, that meant a lot coming from a guy like Jerome. Hey, Ben, the beautiful thing about this, it's just football. <laughs> That's what's so beautiful, it's just football. Woo! In 2004, the rookie quarterback and the 12th year runner carried the Steelers to a 15 and one record. That's how you be a leader, that's how you be a leader. And with another home championship game, Bettis was again on the doorstep of his first Super Bowl. Uh, Picked off the look out, he's going up the sideline. He's gonna walk home for a New England touchdown. Game is over, and I'm pretty sure that I'm retiring, you know, and tears start kind of come down a little bit because I know it's over, and I haven't reached the goal to be a champion. So Ben comes over. You know, I just felt like I had let him down, you know, so I told him um, in a lapse of judgment of mine, I said, if you come back, I promise I'll win you a Super Bowl. And I'm thinking to myself, Unbelievable. this rookie quarterback, <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, man, whatever. And so I addressed the team the next day, and I thank them for being incredible teammates, and that, you know, that was it. That was my last game. The guy like drum bass, just... Man, she's done so much for me as a player. Hurts, hurts, hurts. What part of you wants to come back? Uh, the competitor. The competitor in me to, to come back and say, hey, it's a job, I'm finished. The competitor was intrigued that the next Super Bowl would be in his hometown of Detroit and inspired by the birth of his first child. My daughter, Jada. Hey, baby. 
you changed my life when you came into this world because you came in as a preemie. Not knowing whether you would live or die, you showed me what fight really was. You convinced me I needed to come back for another year and I needed to fight for a chance to win a championship. So baby, thank you, Jay. The new dad missed the start of 2005 with an injury, and a three-game mid-season losing streak left the seven and five Steelers on the brink of playoff elimination. delivered with two touchdowns and the final 100-yard game of his career. And then that one play, it was him and Erlach. It was just one-on-one, -on -one, and I swear, the light, you know how when you watch those cartoons and that little light just shine on y'all too, or you in a movie or an opera or any kind of play, and it's you and him. over Chicago began a historic run for Bettis and the Steelers. No number six seed had ever won three road playoff games and the Super Bowl. The bus is flying. I'm telling you, he flew over the top that time. Looked more like Walter Payton than the bus. Here come the bus! Here come the bus! His mom and dad celebrating. Steelers football. <laughs> Johnny and Gladys Bettis prepared to watch their son seal a huge upset over the top-seeded Colts. We got the ball maybe on a three or four-yard line, and goal line offense goes in. It's like, okay, here we go. That was one of my strengths, to be a closer, to close the games out. Ball, 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 and I'm looking up, I see, and I'm like, no! I remember thinking to myself, like, that can't be Jerome's last play. Like, there's no way the Hall of Fame player and person he is, he can't go down like this. This can't be the lasting memory of him. And the next thought in my mind was, OK, just find a way to get this guy on the ground. That's what he meant to me and meant to probably anybody that's ever been around him. Ben Roethlisberger, brother. Without you saving that tackle, I still might be on the doorsteps, brother. I owe you for life. And now the field goal unit is on with 21 seconds left. Vanderjack kick is on its way. That kick is long enough. And it's no time. It's no time. And boy, nobody has got to be happier than Jerome. Woo! Once Bettis and the Steelers had survived Indianapolis, there was no stopping the bus ride to Detroit. Gets down to the goal line, three yard touchdown run by the bus. And it's on to Detroit for Super Bowl 40. <laughs> you're going home. Oh, you're, you're going home. He would turn around and he would look up at us. He said, we going home. We're going home. He's going back to Detroit, baby. I'm going, going back to Detroit. All through the game, we going home. And we're like, yes, baby, come on home. And it became a reality. Hmm. 
Good to be back. Good to be back. For Super Bowl 40, Jerome Bettis had made it home. And from the time the Steelers arrived in Detroit, wearing his college jersey, Bettis was the toast of the town. I want to present this key to our city to Mr. Jerome Bettis. The Bettis family was also in the spotlight, hosting a team dinner during the week. We did it before, but it's getting to be a habit now, a tradition. And uh, I think it's, it's a good tradition. This is about to be my last game I'm playing with him. So how do you pay a guy back for everything that he gave you over the last eight or nine years? So I said, Bussy, you go ahead and run out. We're going to come behind you. You just take us out on the field, and we'll come right behind you. And I'm thinking, all right, well, I'm just going to say, let's go, and we are going to go. But as he ran out, he thought we were running with him. I'm back there holding everybody. I'm thinking the team's coming with me, and I'm looking back, where is everybody? Throughout Super Bowl week, Bettis had been the star attraction. But on game day, he took a supporting role behind new feature back, Willie up. Parker. Yeah. You don't go in, you see them, they, they wall in that. I had talked to Willie about running this particular play and I wanted him to really think inside and not think outside. Based on his angle way coming in, you're not gonna be able to get outside of it. See what I'm saying? So you gotta, you see him, stick him out back inside. I always listened to him. I, I did it, man, and I kind of ducked outside and came back inside full speed. I only seen, like, green grass. Jerome, man, he drew up that play, man, and I owe that record to him. It parted like the Red Sea, baby. Good job, baby. What he done for me that game, what he done for me for my whole career to that point, like, it meant everything to me. For real, if this your last stop, I don't know what it is, man. Yeah. For real, I love working with you, dog. Thank you, man. Your family, your peace, good. Everybody think about you, dog, for real. You made me what I am, which ain't much, but you helped me, dog, and that's on the real. Yeah. Thank you, man. I appreciate that, Andy. I love you, man. For years, the entire Bettis family had waited for a championship. Oh, I need a timeout. <laughs> now, the time had come for Jerome to close it out. I don't care how many yards you get, but I want you to hold on to the ball. I will. All right, you promise me? I promise you. I'm not going to go six times. Go, go, go. Jerome Bettis coming home. Is this the end of the career? Might be. And what a way to end it. Your hometown in the Super Bowl. And Ben, he had told me a year earlier, you know, I promise you, I'm going to get you to the championship. So it was about right here where Ben caught me. I love you, I love you, man. You Thank promised you. me, man, you came through, man. You're a champion, Thank man. you for everything, Bussie. You hear me? Bussie, you, you mean so much to me, man. I'll never forget this. You hear me? I love you, you hear me? I love you, Bussie. Thank you for everything you've done for me. No problem, I love you. Enjoy it, man. Is this the last stop for the bus? I played this game to win a championship. I'm a champion, and I think the bus is uh, the last stop is here in Detroit. Storybook. It was like, is this really happening to us? Thank God he didn't end it the year before. We got our beautiful daughter and that gave him a resurgence and now here he is holding her in one hand and a Super Bowl trophy in the other. I just had tears coming, I was just so happy. He said, Mom, we did it, we did it. I said, son, we, we are the champs. He said, Mom, we the champs of the world. I said, baby, yes, we are. To win that game and then 
to see my family, it was really a culmination of not only my journey, but their journey as well. They went to every game, so they had seen all the successes. They saw all the failures, so it was really a family experience. I won a championship, but we all won a championship. Johnny Bettis, the 61-year-old father of former Steelers running back Jerome Bettis, has passed away. Bettis apparently suffered a heart attack while driving near his home in West Bloomfield, Michigan. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the Bettis family. That hit me like a ton of bricks to lose my father, to not be able to spend any more time with him, to tell him that I love him. It was, you know, that was rough. It was. My dad was my hero. He was my biggest fan. <laughs> this is tough here. He taught me how to be a man. A little over a year ago, we found out that my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer and it scared and changed all of our lives. But in that moment, I realized where my toughness and where my strength really came from because she handled it like a champion. So mom, thank you for being a role model, credible parent, and a leader. Thank you, mom. The bus ride that began on Aurora Street in Detroit and ended on George Hallis Drive in Canton was a family journey. It makes me feel great. It's the best Johnny Bettis once told his son he didn't have much to offer him other than a good name. Jerome Bettis not only held up that name, he immortalized it. I like that, I like that, I like that. It's such a big honor to get into the Hall of Fame. Thank you, brother. And now that he's in, it's amazing. My dad's in the Hall of Fame. And the last name that is will go down in history. Son, you have greatness running through your blood. And it's not from me. It's from our family. There's not much that I can give you that's more important than our good name. So don't screw it up. And last, I really thought the bus's last stop was in Detroit at Super Bowl 40. But now I know the bus will always and forever run in Canton, Ohio, home of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Thank you. I'm at home.